Welcome everybody to Parkside at Home. My name is Callie. And I'm Deborah. And we are so glad that you are joining us here for our online experience today. Absolutely. This is one of our biggest weeks here at Parkside. Yes. It's a big, big week. Yes. We, um, it is our mission and vision. And we believe that we are here to build bridges between people and Jesus. And one of the best ways that we feel like we can do that is by loving on people and investing in our community. And we get to do this at Kids Week this week. Yeah, we're really excited. All of the fun is going to start on Wednesday evening. We're going to be here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Yeah. It's going to be a ton of fun. We're going to get to have dinner together. We're going to get to play games together. We're going to sing some songs together, I think. I don't know. It's going to be a ton of fun. And so we are really excited about being able to do this for our community and the kids in our community and the families here. And so if you want more information, you can go to parkside.life slash kidsweek to get more information. Or if you're still like kind of on the fence and you're like, I would like maybe to see if they need any help, you can just check it out there. We would love to have you join us. If you call Parkside your home, or even if you're just a friend here at Parkside, we are asking you to join us in praying for Kids Week all week long. We believe that God is going to speak and move in new ways this week. And and we are just asking God to reveal to us ways that we can serve and love on the families within this community. Yeah, so we would love to have you do that with us. Um, And so there's plenty of time also to invite your friends and family to Kids Week. We would just love to have you join us. It's going to be an incredible time. Serving our community is the heartbeat of who we are and what we do. And it's because of your generosity that helps make that a possibility. And we do not take that for granted. So thank you so much. Yeah. So if you feel led um, to partner with us that way, you can go to parkside.life slash give. You can give safely and securely online. And like Callie said, we never take that for granted. We haven't from day one. And we know that part of the reason that we get to be here and to do these things like Kids Week um, is because of people partnering with us in that way. So thank you so much. We're going to head into the message. We're still in our summer school series, which has been such a fun time, just digging into like the hard questions and the things of life. So we would love to know if you're here. You can like or comment on this post uh, to let us know you're here, and we'll get uh, started. Good morning, church. So glad to be here with you today. Gertrude Miller, a 15-passenger van, and Kevin White in a sailor suit. That's the highlights of my story with faith, Jesus, and church. Like, I, I think some of us, maybe you, like, have this, like, really inspiring or encouraging story about, like, how you came to faith or how you begin to interact with church and how all that stuff began. But for me, it was Gertrude Miller, a 15-passenger van, and Kevin White in a sailor suit. Gertrude Miller was a lady that lived uh, in, in, a, in a trailer next door to ours when I was growing up uh, in this little uh, trailer park, actually not too far from here at all, about two miles away from here. I was actually over there yesterday, like reminiscing uh, about uh, those seven years of my life. And, and, and Gertrude uh, invited uh, my siblings and I to our home churches, what will become our home church, Vacation Bible School. And I think there were a couple things at play on on why like Gertrude finally like invited us to church. And like, I'm sure the Holy Spirit had a lot to do with it, but I'm sure she was like, them babies need Jesus. And I'm sure for my mom, the reason she was like willing to put us on a 15 passenger van with a stranger was like, please take these babies. I'm 100% sure that that's what was going on. Also, how have times changed? In the last 30 or so years, as I stare down the barrel, turning 41 here in a few weeks, I accept all manner of gifts. All right? Things have changed. Like, I can't imagine putting my little girl at 11, 12, 13 years old on a van with someone I have never known before and said, have fun, I'll see you in a few hours. But that's what we did. So I got on a 15 passenger bus and for, for well over a year, like that's how I got back and forth to church, Sunday mornings, maybe Sunday nights, but certainly on Wednesday nights. And Benny was actually one of the guys that, that took me to church in a van for a long time. And he has signed an NDA to never tell the stories 
of what happened with me on that church bus. He tried to tell Annabeth a story, and I nearly kicked him down the front stairs because I need my daughter to respect me at least a little bit. But when I showed up to Greenville First Wesleyan Church uh, for that first time, they kind of pile us all in the sanctuary. And on the stage, I remember I was sitting, like this was the church that had the three rows of pews. Like we didn't have a center aisle. We had the two side aisles. I sat all the way on the left, about two thirds back, all the way on the right. Sorry, I still struggle, right? Um, about two thirds back. And I remember looking on the stage and there was Kevin White, the youth pastor dressed in a legit like sailor costume, like like uh, an officer's costume. And I don't know why, I still can't pinpoint it, but for something in my tiny, like 11, 10, 11 year old brain, like I was hooked immediately. I don't remember what the theme was. I don't remember what he did. I don't know why that sticks out in my mind as a, as a point where I was just locked in. And from that moment on, that church couldn't get rid of me. And they may have tried and would have been justified. That, that, that was the beginning of, of what I now call like this, this deep, deep love for the church as an institution, but also as a body, as an organization and an organism. Like you guys have heard me say that a ton of times. Like I love church. I love going to church. I love being at church. I like to go into churches and like see what they got going on. If I meet a new pastor, like I'm going to meet like, hey, let me come check out your spot. Like I'd love to see what's going on. I, I love church, but not just the, the institution. I also love the body of it. And I've often reflected on those first few steps in my journey. And as we kind of start to creep towards our question for today, as we wrap up this summer school series, like, have you thought about like the beginning steps of your faith journey? But not, not just your journey with Jesus, but like your interaction with church. Like, who was the first person to take you to church? Like, do you remember when that happened? And, and going to Greenville first at that point, that wasn't the first time I'd ever been at church. But for me, that's when things really started. Do you remember that moment of you? Was it a church camp or was it your grandparents taking you to church or your parents, aunt, uncles, or a friend invited you? Like, what was your faith journey beginning? What did it look like, especially when it comes to church? I think a lot of, about the stories with Jesus and church and how they're just intertwined together. And my story with Jesus and church are intertwined together. I really can't separate them. Um, one of the cool things that happened once we moved back to Greenville, and I don't know if many people know this, but like uh, because of some responsibilities I had in North Carolina, Deborah and Annabeth and my mom moved down in June of 2019, but I had to stay in North Carolina for a month. Uh, Jason, Someone put Jason and I in charge of a camp of a couple hundred, few hundred teenagers and that went about as well as you think. Actually, it was pretty awesome because he's better, better and smarter than I am. Um, he held the thing together. So I came down like a month later. And so that next Sunday was the first Sunday we were all in town together. And it's like, we can go to church anywhere we want to go to church because there was a time where, you know, like we didn't have like a home base of church. And we went to, to my home church. We went to Greenville first. And, and there was a moment where I'm sitting in that service and it looks completely different than it used to. Like now it's a multicultural church and they have a bilingual service and it, it, the service goes on for a long time. And that definitely wasn't the case when I was there. It's like, it's lunchtime. We got to go, you know, like typical white people church. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just is. Um, but like, I remember sitting in that sanctuary and sitting in that space and hearing God say to me, like, even though like, there was so much different about that place at that moment. It was still home for me. It's still in a lot of ways home for me. And, and God said to me, like, this is the room that throughout your life you've worshiped me in the most. And there's something like compelling about that. And I hope that changes, right? I hope to worship, maybe not in this room. We'll see what happens over the next 15, 20, 30, you know, 30 50 years. We'll see what happens. But, but I can't, take apart my faith in those moments in my life. They were formative. What about you? I think the dynamic between church and, and Jesus and our, and our journeys with both things, they can be really interesting, but they also can be difficult because like I, I have a pretty positive experience, but to say that it was not without hurt and struggle and frustration, it, it wouldn't be true. Like, there are definitely moments where, where I was frustrated and confused by, by my uh, alignment with Jesus and who he says he is, and sometimes how the church doesn't always accurately represent that. That is even as young as we are. There may be people who felt that here. Jesus is good and good to us, but if we're honest, we know that sometimes churches just isn't good. 
that's that's in quality of like what happens because sometimes like you know like if you were here last week you know like the the, the keyboard decides to do its own thing and we all just have a good laugh about it like it's not good but it happened it was funny and sometimes church isn't good because of people because we talked about this a little while ago like people aren't really that good to begin with church hurt is a real thing it happens so sometimes the journey with Jesus and the journey with church, like it, it's really, really hard. And I think because of that, there's this question that, that has arisen over and over and over again throughout the life of the church. I don't know where it started, but I, I know that I've always been aware of it. And it's kind of crept up in different conversations as people are trying to figure out how do I love Jesus, but also how do I interact with the body of people that are supposed to represent him in this world and sometimes do a really, really bad job at it. And I think the church traditionally has tried to devalue this question, but I think that it has some merit to it that's worth digging into it. So here's the question that we're going to dive into together as we wrap up this series. Do I have to go to church to be a disciple? Uh, another form that I've heard is like, do, to be a Christian, do, do I have to go to church? Is it, is it necessary in order to love Jesus and also attend church on a regular basis? Because we all know, especially in the Americanized, the Western version of church, like for years and years and decades and generations, People like me with titles like pastor have looked at you and said, you need to be here as much as you can. You need to not miss a time. You, Sunday nights, Sunday mornings, Wednesday night, prayer meetings, small groups, Sunday school, all kind of things. And, and you guys know, like, we kind of do that too. Like Callie sp has spent a lot of time over the last month saying, you need to come to block party. You need to come to kids week. Like we're always asking you to come to things and sometimes people like me have, have roped in guilt trips to say like somehow there's a connection between your faith in Jesus and faithful church attendance. And I think sometimes when people like us start to ask questions of those things should be tied so closely together, the church just says, whoa, 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 wait a minute, time out. You certainly, you certainly can't ask that question. I think it's worth digging into. Do I have to go to church to be a disciple? I think we first need to address the problem with this question. It's the notion or the concept of have to. I think that's a really strange way to frame our thinking around questions like this. Do I, do I have to? Discipleship is an ongoing, growing relationship with Christ. Like that, that's a good way to describe it, if I do say so myself. It's a growing and ongoing relationship with God. And we need to understand that this is something that God wants for us, He wants with us, but He will not force it upon us. He wants you to want it. It's kind of like, Deborah with me doing the dishes. I will do it if she asks me to do it, but she wants me to want to do it, and I don't want to do it. I don't know anybody that wants to watch. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Jesus wants us. God wants us to want our relationship with him, and he's not going to force us to do it. So when we start talking about things like have to, things can get weird pretty quickly. And also looking at it from that perspective, it funnels us into this works Works-based faith. If I do the right things enough, then I'm good. And honestly, like a, a lot of what we were taught growing up in church, this Americanized Western version of, of faith, of Christianity, it, it pushes us right towards works-based. If you, if you show up enough, if you serve enough, if you give enough, then you're good. You're good with God. That's how you get right with God is doing enough, giving enough, being present enough. So I think we need to move, remove ourselves from the equation from this question. I think we say all the time, we just talked about it over the last couple of weeks, like we should let Scripture shape our thinking, not try to fit Scripture into the way that we already think, right? We, so we got to go to Scripture and say, what does Scripture say about this question or this concept, this notion? Do we have to go to church to be a disciple? I think Paul uh, gives us a pretty clear insight to where the foundation of a disciple's faith comes from in Ephesians chapter 2, 
couple verses uh, in 8-9. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. All right, so like, leave that up there just for a second, Zach. Like, I want us to take a look at it and, and really ponder it for a second, because I think there's some really clear things in here. For it is by grace you have been saved, not by your works. There is nothing you can do that will merit salvation. It is only the grace and the gift of God. God's salvation is for us, and it's by His grace given to us through our faith in Him. Hmm. That doesn't say anything about faithful church attendance, does it? Your salvation is through grace alone, through faith alone. Well, what about Jesus? Like, that's what Scripture says. Like, that, that's a good summation of what Scripture says about the issue. Well, what about Jesus? Like, how did he live? What did he do? Because sometimes, like, we, you know, like, we can look at the totality of Scripture, but it is always good to look at Jesus and the way that he lived his life as an example. All right, so let's look at it. What did he do? Jesus, we know this. He grew up in a Jewish home. I think we know that. Like, everyone knows that. that he grew up in a Jewish home. Like, he was a Jew, right? And the Jewish community... And if we know anything about the Jewish faith and Jewish community, that their culture, there was no shortage of do's and don'ts. The law was everything to the Jewish people. It still is. Jesus would have been very, very familiar with this. And there was very, very, uh, there, there was much included about the laws and things like that in regards to the Sabbath, right? To what we do to, to set aside time that's holy and pointed towards the worship of God. And in Mark 12, Jesus was confronted by these Pharisees, these group of religious leaders that were all about the law. They were all about teaching people and telling people to live by the law, even when they didn't do it themselves. They were, t- they were talking about his disciples who were walking through a field and they reached out and grabbed some grain on the Sabbath to, to eat on their way. And they're like, why in the world are your followers doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, here's what's crazy is that like by the letter of the law, he, they had them dead to rights. They had, they had broken the law. It was legal for them to go through and grab grain or grab uh, uh, crops that were going. That was legal. But doing on the Sabbath was not. You can't do that. Had them dead to rights by the letter of the law. But Jesus says something really interesting in Mark uh, chapter 2 or chapter 12. I can't remember. Whatever's on the screen is right. Uh, he says... Uh, to the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made for the man, not man for the Sabbath. I would have loved to seen the look on the Pharisees' face. Because like, this was a complete contradiction of what they had known to believe, right? And what they were teaching other people. The Sabbath was everything. The law was everything. But Sabbath law was at the top. You do not break the Sabbath law. It is everything to Jewish people. And Jesus says, you know what? Like, this was put in place for us, not us for it. The law was created as a set of guardrails so that we can experience freedom in Christ. We've talked about it a lot over the last several weeks. That's what those things are for. But being a disciple isn't about following a discipleship formula. Church attendance plus tithing does not equal a good disciple. That's not what the formula is. And if we look at Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders, those who did all the right things, he had some pretty harsh words for them when it came to how they were actually living their life in contrast to what they were teaching. This is actually some of the most like, difficult and convicting verses of Scripture that I've read like, because it's like, I do not want to be lumped in with these people. Jesus says in Matthew chapter, 27, or chapter 23, verse 27, Woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You were like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you were full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. There's another part just up the page a little bit where he says, Woe to you, you teachers of the law, you Pharisees. You will travel the world for one convert and then make them twice the sons of hells that you are. But these are bold words for Jesus. 
I mean, like, can you imagine walking up to a religious leader in the community and calling them a hypocrite and being completely justified to do so? I mean, these are, are, are big, big words. So if we're looking at the Bible and, and like what, what Paul said, the way Jesus lived his life, it may seem like the answer to the question from a biblical standpoint to the, the question of, like, do we have to go to church to be a disciple? The answer is no. Like, it's like faith and grace is what brings us salvation. Following the, the, the letter of the law, just to follow the letter of the law, is, is not what faith and growing faith is. But I think if we look a little bit deeper into Jesus' life, the way he actually lived, we can see how Jesus interacted with the idea of church in a different way. And I think things get really, really interesting. We know what Jesus said to the Pharisees. We know what Paul said, but, but how did he actually live his life? And I think looking at the life of Jesus throughout the Gospels, we can see him interacting with, with church in the two senses of the idea of church. Church as the event that we attend and church as the community that we belong to. Those are things that are tied together, but they are kind of separate things. There's the event that happens for us every week, right? And then there's also the body of believers that make up the church. We get extensive information in the Gospels about the birth of Jesus, right? It's kind of covered in a, in a few different places in the Gospels. And then obviously we get a lot about the tail end of his life, the last year of his life. But the stuff in the middle is pretty sparse. In fact, we don't really hear anything from like a little while after the birth of Jesus until he turns 12. So there's, there's a lot about his childhood that we just don't know. But we do find this moment in Luke chapter 2 where his family has made this trek into Jerusalem for the Passover, which was customary. Jesus was about 12 years old. And after the festival, so they'd spent some time in Jerusalem. They had celebrated the Passover, and now they're making their way back home. And Jesus had been missing. Like, they'd been on the road for a whole day before his parents are like, Hey, y'all seen Jesus? Earlier today, like, Hannah and Eli, were, or Hannah and Matt were looking for Eli, and I was like, have you seen Eli? And he'd been missing for about probably 35 seconds. Could you imagine being gone a whole day before, and I'm trying not to judge Mary and Joseph. He's like, oh, I'm sure he's with his aunt Josephine, or he's over there at Grandma and Nana's house, or whatever, you know, like, whatever. But like, he'd been missing for a whole day, so they had to travel a whole day back to Jerusalem to find him, and they found him three days after he had gone missing. You know where he was at? He's at the temple. He was at the temple. And his response to his mother when they find him, it floors me every time I think of it. Because it's like, is Jesus talking back to his mom? Surely not, because he's Jesus. He's perfect. He didn't talk back to his mother ever. And Beth, pay attention, okay? They found him at the temple, and he says to him in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, Why are you searching for me? He asks. Didn't you know I had to be at my father's house? Did you catch that? I had to be at my father's house. Throughout the Gospels, there are several accounts of Jesus spending time intentionally at the temple. In, Mark, in Matt, Matthew 21, in Mark 11, in Luke 19, in John 2. Jesus is going to church a lot, way more than we go. And even though he consistently broke down man-made religious expectations, his response to his parents when he was just a boy characterized his life as an adult. I had to be in my father's house. So now we see this weird turn. Like, like we see in these moments in the scripture where it's like, do we have to go to church? Like, do we have to do this? But Jesus says, I did. I, I had to be in my father's house, but it wasn't out of religious obligation. It was out of this desire to be connected with God and to be around God's people. But even taking this a step further, more than just the institution of church, even more than going to temple, it's very clear to see that the church as a body was really, really important to Jesus. I mean, if we know anything consistently about the life of Jesus, is he lived in community all the time. It wasn't just something that happened. It's the way that they lived their life. I mean, he traveled with a, a pack, an entourage all the time. And it wasn't like, 
There, Jesus was the celebrity and all these people had to be around. Some of that stuff happened from time to time, but those people that traveled with him, his disciples, right? Not just the 12. There were others there that traveled with him throughout his ministry. They lived life together. It wasn't like they were all support staff for Jesus. They were friends. They were family. They connected on the deepest, deepest level. In Matthew 18, Jesus is speaking to the value of community when it comes to our faith, and he said something that should help us put some things into perspective on what church really is. Matthew 18, 20. For when two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. If we think about it in that context, like it can really change and expand the idea of what church is. See, we, we, get, we meet here every, every Sunday at 1030 at the Sterling Community Center. We tell people, hey, if you want to come to church, we, we, Sterling Community Center at 1030. We get here at 7 o'clock and we set everything up and we have church, and we have service, we have coffee. Sometimes Lynn brings treats. It's great. Like, this is what we do. Like, we have it in this little segmented time. But Jesus says, like, oh, I just need two or three people who gather in my name. We can have church anytime, anywhere. That means that ministry, discipleship, growth can and should happen outside of this space and this time. That's what church is as an organism, as a, as a body, as a community. That's, that means the majority of the discipleship, disciple making work that happens should happen outside of these four walls. But this space and time should serve as an anchor point that we come back to it's the common ground that we all can find together. Now, what's really great is I, I know I've gotten to know a lot of you guys and, and know what you do for a living and what your life is like, things that you're interested in, things like that. And what, what's crazy is that we are all in different places, ages, places in life and socioeconomic situations, family dynamics, even coming from different faith backgrounds and standpoints and perspectives. But this is a place that we can come back to and say, like, hey, this is a place we all can agree. We like it here. Most of us. It's fun. We enjoy it. We enjoy the community. It's a, it's a common ground that we all share. So maybe the problem is we're asking the wrong question. Maybe it's time for us to rethink our thinking and reframe the question. Because the Bible doesn't explicitly say that we have to go to church to be a disciple. It doesn't say that. I couldn't find it anywhere. It does say things like don't give up meeting together as some, as some have gotten the habit of doing. But it doesn't say like you on Sunday morning, you got to be at church at 9, 10 or 11, 30, whatever it is. It does, however, explain the value in disciple making community. And like I said, maybe it's time to rethink our thinking and reframe that question. Maybe the question we should be asking ourselves is how does the church help me grow as a disciple? How can being involved in community from from an organizational standpoint, from from an organism standpoint, how can it help me grow as a disciple? Now, this is the point where you start to check out and say, this is just Matt trying to tell me that I need to be in church every Sunday. No, it's not. Because here's the deal. Here's what some pastors won't tell you. And if I've been accused of anything in my life and in my career is saying things that I shouldn't say or other pastors don't say. Here it is. Your church attendance is none of my business. How often you show up, whether you pay attention while you're here, if you nod off to sleep, none of my business, none of my concern. If, if, if you're not here and I shoot you a text or give you a call or, or catch up with you and say, hey, I missed you, it's because I missed you. Not because I missed your body being here to fill a seat so we could put it on a, a record somewhere that we had so many people at church. The goal and mission of Parkside Church is to build bridges between people and Jesus, not people and Parkside Church. Our, our ma- the, the model that we put our mission and vision around is not church growth for church growth's sake. It's so you get to know Jesus better. 
So you learn how to become a better disciple, a disciple that makes disciples. That is why we are here. We are not here to grow the brand, to grow the business, so that everybody knows who the pastors are. That's disgusting. I don't like it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. That is not who we are. Your church attendance is not my business. I'm not like your dad waiting by the door like you're late for a cure for you. Like, where have you been? If you ever question that, when I call or text you and say, hey, look, we missed you on Sunday. We we would love to see you. It's because I missed you. Because I enjoy seeing your face. Not because I'm worried about where you are. If you come to me and say, hey, you know what? Our season here has been great, but it's time for us to find something new. I'm going to be like, talk to me why. Tell me why. So let us know if we can do things better, right? And then let me find you a place to go. Let me help you find you a place to go where you can go get involved and grow. That's it. But we believe that being engaged at church can make a critical difference in your discipleship. Not our programming, not our statistical reports, right? Not our status as a church. Do not care. But notice I said engaged, not present. The goal is not to have you present at church. It's to have you engaged with the body. And I think there's a couple of things I want to dive into in our last couple of minutes that, that, that can help us unpack and understand why that is important, why church engagement is important to our discipleship versus just showing up or just not being involved at all. The first thing is the church helps us grow as disciples because we're better together. We are absolutely better together. You need community. If you're sitting there right now and you're like, no, I don't. You have a pride issue. We need to unpack that. And guess what? We can do that in community. You need community because it's nearly impossible to grow your faith in isolation. I've I've been a believer for a long time. I've been in ministry for, I'm starting to creep up on 25 years now. Not once have I ever seen someone really grow in their faith, in their discipleship, become closer to God, living in isolation. However, I have seen over and over and over again people who remove themselves from the body of Christ shrink in their faith, question their faith, struggle with deconstruction, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing altogether, but they don't ever reconstruct. They don't come back and bring it back. We are not meant to be alone. James highlights the point of the importance of leaning into community in his epistle. In, in uh, chapter 5, it says, If uh, any of, anyone among you is sick, let him call on the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Amen. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. I mean, this, this is community. This is part of what it looks like. So like when you're struggling, when you're, when you're in the hurt, whether it's, it's, it's physical healing that you need or spiritual or relational healing that you need, mental health wise, like, like James says, like bring them to the church. Let those who are of the faith come around them and pray for them and let them confess what's going on in their life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and let's support one another through it. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And I'm reminded as I read this that in times of struggle, like I said, physically, mentally, spiritually, relationally, there's power of having people that love God and love me advocating to the Father for me, alongside me. Also, when I I need a a soft place for my mistakes to land, God's provision of grace is through community. I should be able to come to this group of people and say, you know what? This is what I'm struggling with right now. This is what I got going on. And it's a soft place to land. People that won't judge me, that will love me through the consequences and through restoration. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And we cannot do that well on our own. If you are in the midst of struggle, uncertainty, of doubt, whether it's yourself or faith, I'm one of the first questions I think you should ask yourself is, have I isolated myself? Have I put myself alone? That might be a good place to start. 
being engaged with the body of Christ in community, what we call church, helps us grow as individuals, introspectively. But I think there's another perspective to consider. Here's the second thing. The church is a vessel that God uses to bring salvation to the world. This, this is a, a thought process that I've been mulling over for years and years and years. Because like when people say like the church is broken, it's messed up. Y- yes, it is. I'm not sure how and why there was an expectation that it was supposed to be perfect ever got put out there because that was an unrealistic expectation because the church is full of broken people. Like even the most faithful of us all, right, are still have our issues. Paul, who we kind of, who literally is venerated and is put as, as a saint in so many people's eyes, right? Like he talks clearly about his struggles as a believer, as a disciple, as an apostle. And yet there's so many people that walk around that, that, are, that have been hurt by the church because they put unrealistic expectations. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, there's going to come a point where I'm going to disappoint you as a pastor. There's already come a point where there's a few I've, that I've frustrated or made mad. or you know, Why are you laughing, Ashley? Like, it hurts. Because she knows. Like, no uncertain terms here. Like, I'm a dummy. And I say dumb things all the time. But even though it's a broken vessel, it's still the, the, the way that God is bringing salvation into the world. I've said it in this setting many, many times. I love church. I love it. And so it makes sense that one of the most influential passages in my life in Scripture is about church. It's found in Acts chapter 2. It's, it's, toward, it's the very end of Acts chapter 2. And, and this is the foundation of the church. Like this is when things, the organized church, really started to come together. Jesus had been crucified. He'd been buried, resurrected. He had ascended to heaven. And then the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost. And the, and the apostles were starting to spread the gospel like wildfire. The church was here. They called it the way. Organized church had come to the world. And in six verses at the end of Acts chapter 2, we learn all that we need to know about what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. And I would love to read it for you. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone that, who had need, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and together with glad and sincere hearts. Oh my goodness. How I long for this to be true again. In our world, but like, that, that seems too big. It's not, it's not too big for God, but it seems too big for me in my feeble mind. But right here in, in our neck of the woods, in, in, in the Sterling neighborhood, in West Greenville, in Greenville at large, in Easley, in Pattersville, in Piedmont, in, in Simpsonville, in Malden, in the upstate. Like, how amazing would it be if this were true again? That, that because the church was doing what the church was designed to do, taking care of each other, taking care of people outside the walls of the church, that we could, we could say things like, we enjoyed the favor of all people, that, that we met together with glad and sincere hearts. How I long for that to be true again. These verses clearly outline our role as the church and God's role in response. And I think we've got it twisted. I think we've tried to take God's responsibility, and because of that, we've forsaken our responsibility in these verses. As a body of disciples, this is our role, as a body of disciples who makes disciples. The role of saving the world, that belongs to God. That is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is, learning and worshiping together, living in community, praying, selflessly loving the community that we're in. That is our responsibility. That's our role. And it's God's job to add daily those that are being saved. If we do our part, he'll do his. 
I can't save anyone. Don't have the ability. Don't even want that pressure. But I can partner with God by helping provide a place where people can feel safe to explore who God is and the ways for them to discover and live out their God-given purpose. I can be a disciple who makes disciple. Side note, that has nothing to do with me being a pastor. That has nothing to do with any kind of degrees or experience. It doesn't have to do with my, my vocational choices. That is something that is for all of us who call on the name of Jesus to be disciples who make disciples. So let's revisit this question. Do I have to go to church to be a disciple? No, you don't. But if you want to grow in your discipleship, you should. You should. But I think at its core, it's the wrong question. I think we've got to look at it a little bit differently. I think the way that we've been looking at it is self-centric, it's self-motivated, and it's about doing just enough to get by. But I think asking, how can the church help me grow as a disciple is a much more gospel-centered question. I know the church isn't perfect. I know our church isn't perfect. Sometimes it's not even that good. <laughs> And sometimes it might even be hurtful, but God's intent and the goal that we're working towards is for it to be a place for you to grow in your discipleship and learn the art and the practice and the ministry of making disciples. So the question is, will you continue or start or re-engage? Based on the reframing of the question, that it, that it, that is how you, you grow in your discipleship, in the community of it. Will you become an active part of the community as opposed to as a passive attender? I'm not trying to get more out of you. That, like I said, that's not my business. What I'm trying to do is encourage you through the, the word of God to, to engage for the purpose of growing closer to him. And look, I'll say this, like, I'll be honest with you. One of the reasons I struggled to write this message is because, like, does this really apply? Because you guys are actually really great at this. You, we are humbled and blown away at how great you guys are at engaging and serving. And you're, you're going to get a chance to do that, hopefully, this afternoon. Lord, please hold off the rain, right? And, and temperatures down a little bit would be great, too. And then again, uh, on Wednesday through Friday with Kids Week, and you guys, every time we've asked you, you have come, you have come out every time. But maybe your next step isn't necessarily just engaging. Now, maybe your next step is inviting people into community. Not to church, to community. To, to be with people that love them and love God and want the best for them. And like I said, I don't, mean, I don't mean invite them to church. I mean invite them into your life, right? Maybe that person in your life that God has kind of been like pushing you towards connecting with, maybe the first step is, hey, hey, won't you come to church with me on Sunday? That'd be great. Like, I'll save a seat for you. That's what we used to say. Like, I'll save a seat for you. Maybe that's not your next step. Maybe the next step is like, hey, won't you come over for dinner? Can we go to Cantina 76 and get tacos? Like, can we grab some coffee at Summer Moon? Can we get a biscuit at Maple Street? Like, maybe that's the next step. I think for years, because of like church growth models, people like me have looked at people like you and said, you got to get them to church, you got to get them to church. You get them here, we'll do the rest. And there is nothing in Scripture that supports that thinking. Maybe we're, we need to invite people into our life to practically live out the example of Acts Chapter two, invite people to meals, pray with them, live life together, help meet their needs, invite them to our homes, invite them into our lives. And then watch what the Lord does. And that's what gets me excited. That's what just, just makes me like, if I had a propeller, I'd be gone. That's not the weirdest thing I've said today. Watch what the Lord will do. And I'll tell you, spoiler alert, he already says it. He will add to the number those that are being saved. That's what he'll do when we invite people into community, not just invite them to church. We invite people into a discipleship relationship. He will add to the number those that are being saved. Let's pray together. Lord, especially on a day like today where like 
a big arm of our outreach ministry is, is taking place today and more of it's taking place here over the next few days. Like, this is an important week in the life of our church. But help us not to forget why we're doing it. We're doing it to build a bridge between people and you. Not to Parkside Church. Not to, certainly not. It's pastors. And I think I'm so thankful that even though church can be difficult, it can be hurtful because it's full of broken people, its design is to encourage us to help us grow closer to you. And Lord, I, I pray for all of us right now that we'll, that we'll fight the attack of the enemy to become self-centric and self-motivated and, and start thinking through works-based mentality or like the bare minimum mentality. Like, what's the, what's the least I got to do to get by? Lord, I, I want to give you everything. I want to give you the most. Not so anybody can look at me and say, wow, look what he did. I right, forget that. That's because you deserve it. And the best possible life that, that any of us can live is by giving you what we have, even if we feel like it's not that good. And Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that you would kind of put on our hearts, like, or continue to put on our hearts, those in our lives that we know that, that you want to, to connect with and you want us to reach out to and help us to, like, not take the easy way and toss them a card or, hey, you should come to church and kind of be passive, but like, hey, we just invite them to our lives. Have them in our homes and maybe meet a need. Help us to, to, to focus on what you would do, not just bring them to a service. Because those things will come in time. But help us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you about what our next step is. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. As we stand and sing, I pray that you would be worshipped and that you would meet us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. No matter where you're at in your life or your faith journey, we do not believe that it was an accident that you were here with us today. We hope that you left this message feeling uh, encouraged, but also challenged. If you felt the Lord speaking to you today, we would love to to know and we would love to walk alongside with you as you uh, go into your next steps when it comes to your faith journey. So you can go to parkside.life slash respond and let us know and one of us will reach out to you just to walk with you and help you out in any way possible.